everyone. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all the viewers who are watching this uh, 39 Distinguished Lecture Series, DLS, from all over the world. So this is DLS. My name is uh, Liberty from School of Civil Engineering. Faculty of Engineering will be your host for today's session. So we are, great, uh, we are very grateful to have our speaker today. Uh, Prof. Dr. Faisal Khan from the Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada, to share with us about uh, lessons from COVID-19 safety and risk engineering perspective. So before that, uh, I will welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Prof. Dato I.R. Dr. Omar Rafi bin Dato Abdul Hadi, to introduce our honorable speaker, Prof. Faisal Khan. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Alibriati. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to our 38th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Faisal Khan from Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Faisal Khan is Professor and Canada Research Chair, Tier 1 of Offshore Safety and Risk Engineering. He is the founder of the Centre for Risk Integrity and Safety Engineering, CRISE, which have over 100 research members. His areas of research interest include safety and risk engineering, inherent safety, risk management, and risk-based integrity assessment and management. He is actively involved with multinational energy industries on the issue of safety and asset integrity. He also served as safety and risk advisor to government of Newfoundland, Canada. He continues to serve as a subject matter expert to many organizations that include Lloyd's Register EMEA, SBM Modco, Husky Energy, Intexi, Technip, and Qatar Gas. In 2008 to 2010, he visited Qatar University and Qatar Gas LNG Company as Process Safety and Risk Management Research Chair. In 2012 and to 2014, he served as Visiting Professor of Offshore and Marine Engineering at the Australian Maritime College, AMC, University of Tasmania, Australia, where he led the development of Offshore Safety and Risk Engineering Group and an initiative of global engagement with many international institutions. He is the recipient of the President Outstanding Research Award 2012-2013, the Canadian Society for Chemical Engineering National Award on Process Safety Management of 2014, President Outstanding Research Supervision Award 2013-2014, and recently, the Society of Petroleum Engineer Award for his contribution in health, safety, and risk engineering. He has authored over 500 research articles in peer-reviewed journals and conferences on safety, risk, and reliability engineering, and has also authored five books on the subject area. That is a brief biography of our speaker. Here now is Professor Faisal Khan from Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada, with his talk entitled Lessons from COVID-19, Safety and Risk Engineering Perspective. Professor Faisal Khan. Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rafiq, for such a elaborate uh, uh, bio. I'm not sure whether I deserve it. Um, well, thank you, Liberati, for uh, uh, inviting or sharing this opportunity to me. Um, my dear fellow friends who are viewing this from wherever in different part of the world, greetings to you and those who are practicing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, this is personally a great uh, pleasure for me um, to be speaking in, in remotely uh, because I consider UTM as, as, as my second home. Those who may know, um, perhaps in Malaysia, one of the most visited places I have is the UTM. I have so many friends and uh, so many colleagues whom I have worked and continue to work. So this is... Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be connecting them on this uh, unprecedented situations uh, through remotely. And it is a great honor for them to provide me opportunity to connect you all. So what I'm going to do today in the next 
45, max to 50 minutes to share some thoughts as we all passing through one of the most troubled time perhaps of the century and what we have learned and how can we be more resilient. So that's where I'm trying to focus today. And I hope that uh, you get some lessons out of it, which might help you as individual or as community and as a nation to be stronger and take proactive measures to be enable a healthy recovery and perhaps resilient. So bear with me for a minute while I share the screen and uh, begin uh, the talk on that aspect. So as Professor mentioned, my, today my focus would remain into a lesson learned from COVID-19. I must declare that I am not an epidemiologist or a medical scientist. I'm an engineer like perhaps many of you. Um, I have no training or education in any of the epidemiological studies, so I am no way aiming to claim any aspect of epidemiological studies. What I'm hoping to do today is to ponder, to wonder like all of you, perhaps majority of you, if not all, that what are we passing through? And what is this? Because perhaps most of us, this is one of the unprecedented situations. We are already in 250 days of the, and 150 days of partial lockdown, at least I can share my personal experience that I have, I have been locked down in a place um, which is the, where I have only visit place is for a coffee uh, to a particular shop. And that's where my life is confined. In terms of external exposure, from a work point of view, we continue to operate as normal as we could. So that imbalance is, is, is affecting all of us in all possible aspect of our life. So I wonder what have we learned from this situation that make us to be prepared better for coming days, coming months or year. So one thing which has come out very clear as many of you who have been very actively reading on the material that has proven a very old saying a very exceptionally valid here in the condition is that prevention is better than cure. I mean, there is no better time to prove this as it is applicable today. So that is something what has, has keep guiding me to my actions. This is what keep defining me to prepare my tomorrow. And that's how, why I wish to see that we all in one form or other learn this, that how can we better uh, in a preventive mode rather than reacting it. So based on these fundamental questions and thoughts which have been uh, pondering me, my and my colleagues have been uh, wondering that what and how could we contribute in this important challenge. And that's where today my talk is focused on is to share with you some of the outcome of my colleagues and my students who has done or devoted their time on understanding and applying the principle of inherent or principle of safety into the pandemic risk management. Because the health science-based epidemiological studies is well guided, well suited and well designed. But because we live in a very complex system, Perhaps an engineering system approach might help us to better demystify the correlation or interdependency of different parameters and help us guide. That's where my focus is. That's where today, the next 35 to 40 minutes, we will remain focused. So i give you a brief history. I'm sure you all must be tracking this on an hourly basis or a daily basis or a weekly basis, depend upon where you are, uh, means I'm at least following up on a daily basis. So as of today, we have Canada and 122939 confirmed cases and Newfoundland, which is the island, as you could see on the window on the right side, has about 268 confirmed cases with three deaths and 263 recovery. But 
Having said that, which is very small compared to the world current ongoing condition, but having said that, we are in a very strongly lockdown conditions because we are island and we need to protect our people in the form that they, 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 they can maintain and respond to this pandemic condition. So message I'm trying to give out of this that you see this quite red, oranges, and a little bit of white. My dear friends, uh, fear is that as time passes, this is going to look more and more ugly as the time proceeds, and it, we are witnessing that as, as it is. So what and could we do to help minimize this impact is the question for our, for our mind. So before we go and start attempting to answer the question, let's try take a step back and see what have we learned so far? I mean, this is from a safety engineering perspective. This is an established field. We have been dealing with the hazardous conditions that have a catastrophic nature or hazard all along from a nuclear to the hydrocarbons to the toxic material, you name. Have we learned that how do we deal with them in a safer way? So while we have been great success in converting some of the hazardous situations or material into useful product, we have our history of learning and we continue to learn. For example, in 2005, we blew up one of our, refi our refinery in Texas, as you could see, which has caused a significant uh, human impact in terms of fatality and financial. And uh, then followed up with the next five years, uh, another major accident in the United States uh, for Macando. And the story continues. And I'm specifically citing this example to demonstrate that this is what we call developed nation who has access to the best technologies and best minds. And they we continue to witness such incident or catastrophic incidents or accidents. So there must be some underlying situation that is telling us that we are not learning, or if we are learning, we are not implementing our learning in an effective way. And that cannot be more evident than what we have seen this week uh, from the Beirut explosion, if you witness. As you might have seen, that 2,000 plus 10 of ammonium nitrate exploded, completely flattened the whole uh, birth of the port. Means what else could we talk about? So this is the history of the safety engineering, which guides us to operate in a safer environment so that we continue to operate our facility, which make an economical contribution in a safer way. So while we have achieved a lot of success, such as building such a successful nuclear plant that power our homes, houses, we have hydrocarbons that guiding our all form of energy. We are now exploring hydrogen energy that is a upcoming cleaner energy source, but they all come with the challenges and we need to prepare that challenge for that challenge. And that is the message what safety engineering does. But if we reflect, on the same token, to our health sciences, has this pandemic what we are facing is, is a, out of a blue? Answer is no. If you look in the history, and I'm only capturing in the last decades of history, we have been observing this or seeing this in one form or another. Whether it's a swine flu, an, an Ebola epidemic, or Zika, or Ebola, you name, we have seen this all. But unfortunately, we continue to be ignorant. And the syndrome of ignorance is that this is in somebody else's backyard. We keep thinking this is a problem of someone else. It's not us. And that is, I cannot accept more than what has been discussed or mentioned in 2005. So I briefly play what Bill Gates has said about today's situation in 2015. And that will give us a clear message that what we are in today is not, to be honest, a completely unknown situation. It was seen by many that it's coming. It's just that we didn't prepare ourselves. And that's the part we will take later. So for a few minutes, I'll play a video to make a point.
when I was a kid, the disaster we worried about most was a nuclear war. That's why we had a barrel like this down in our basement filled with cans of food and water. When the nuclear attack came, we were supposed to go downstairs, hunker down and eat out of that barrel. <laughs> Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. So my dear friends, as you could clearly see, uh, the visionary folks like Bill Gates and many others have seen it's coming. And there were earlier symptoms of, as I briefly captured. So what, why we haven't uh, really paid attention is the focus, is the topic I wanted to discuss today. And that goes back to uh, our approach, our attitude. We in engineering tend to believe and continue to focus on reacting to the situation. Whereas what we need to do is to respond. And that's where the debate I wanted to focus today, that how could we respond to a situation rather than continue to react to the situation? And that is the key element. So I'll take that from engineering perspective, and then I will move into to, to the COVID-19. So let's take an example. If we have to prepare a response from an accident perspective or accident prevention perspective, we would aim to model an accident that how could it take place or how could it occur. So here is my very simple mind explanation. An accident often to our eyes or to our brain look like a very instantaneous act. Just like a good is all happening, but within a second or a fraction of a second, it turned out to be bad. Just like we're driving a reasonable speed, a car on a highway, and boom, within a second, we met an accident. So now all the good has translated into bad. That's how we see it. But truth is, accident didn't happen as instantly as what we witnessed. It actually had a very gradual way of occurring, which I'm trying demonstrating through the blue lines. So these blue lines are the actual pathway of translating a good to a bad. But this, because we do not have a, a, a comprehension in the brain or eyes, we can't see, we generally see an instantaneous effect. So engineers and scientists have realized this. So they, what they did, they start monitoring it. So this is what we call as symptoms. And we monitor these symptoms. So going back to example of a car, when we were driving on the highway, we now have monitoring our speed, our brake conditions, and all other parameter that could possibly form one of the blue lines. So as you could now see a modern car, you would have a lot of indicators or dashboard indicators that tell you the status of your blue lines. But if you could, would agree with me, perhaps, that in spite of we have established a good success into monitoring, but we still continue to see accident, as I briefly mentioned in my earlier few slides. Why? Because the accident causation, unfortunately, not always an independent line, as I'm showing in the blue. That is formation of a complex interconnecting pathway, which is the shortest pathway, and perhaps which we are unable to monitor. And that is, I'm trying showing with the red line. So while we continue to monitoring the blue line, but there is a interconnected red line forming, and that is what translating a good to bad. So the questions come, how do we manage? How do we predict it? And that's the job as a safety engineers or a modeler. We have that this red line is the real culprit. We need to predict or model this and then perhaps verify or monitor this red line because that will guide us to know where we are. And that is what is contemporary or required today. That rather than we overly relying on monitoring the symptoms, 
which is the blue line, we need to model the red line and then monitor the red line so that we know how far or how close we are for a potential accident. So that's how today in most hazardous operations we would ensure, and this is what we do as a part of enhancing the safety of our systems. So if we try to take this red line and put it through the microscope in the metaphoric form, this is how we would see that the straight line is really not a straight line, but actually the different steps. And these steps are quite visible and sometimes actually monitorable, such as near misses, mishap, incident, and accident. Like if you go back and try to study the, your railroad accident, you might have noticed that you were casually driving and just a few minutes back, you actually didn't pay attention and you changed the lane without giving the indicator. That was a close near miss. So there was a symptom that something was not happening as it should be. But because it didn't give a negative outcome, we tend to be blinded about it. And that eventually a sequential of that could cause an incident. And the same is true with epidemic situation, is that big pandemic situation has been occurring, whether it's H1N1, Zika, or it is Ebola. We continue, we means a plural we, the West and other nation, continue to think that is a problem of someone else. But it has become evident that the COVID-19 is not sparing anyone. This is one thing that perhaps has proven the fact that all humanity is the same. Whether it's president who is protected like anyone, no one can imagine or approach, he or she is getting affected. A homeless person who is living on the street without it is also affected. You're living in the palace or you're living on a street is not spared. No religion, no region, no caste, no color is spared from this. That is one way is very unifying to see. And that's why it is so alarming and worrying. Perhaps this is a greater, greater awakening call for us to understand that when calamity comes, it doesn't spare, it doesn't choose or select. It could impact all. And that's one of the key message uh, the pioneers or visionaries have mentioned in their earlier talks about uh, catastrophe of influenza or other similar issues. And this is well proven here. So how do we manage this is what in, from engineering perspective, in our view, we will do through the risk management. We'll identify the hazards. We will do the frequency analysis, means finding out how likely it is to occur. We'll understand its impact, and then we assess the risk. And then we'll design the intervention, which we call as risk minimization. And this risk intervention or minimization or control will form a whole risk management strategy. And this is a, a iterative process because actions we take will going to change the whole process. So we need to continue monitoring and reassessing. So this is a loop situation. So in the risk management of our hazardous operations, we continue to monitor, assess, and manage. And this is a cyclic system that we manage or do. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we apply the same system of understanding, to a COVID-19 situation, then what we have here is that we need to aim to flatten this curve as many people have been talking in the media and others in a common language. What that simply means is we try to minimize the impact and pro probably spreading it longer so that we can manage in a more timely manner. So, we cannot take away this curve. The only thing is rather than a sharp, we're trying to flatten so that we can manage it better. But while we're making this risk management strategy to flatten this, 
we are incurring huge cost, as you could say, on the below curve, where in the economic terms, we are, as we take action of lockdown or border seals or all other social distancing and their activity, it is bringing our curve of economic depreciation um, to be negatively alarming. So we need to reverse that cycle as well. So as you could see clearly here, there are two conflicting approaches countering each other. And that's the key element for us as a scientist and engineer is need to balance these two flattening curves. We need to flatten the top while we're trying to minimize the flattening of the or uh, exclusion of the bottom curve. And that can only take place not by your and my actions. That require the governmental or the regulatory component. And that is where the key is. So we need to rely on the policies of the government. They are the impacting majority of us, perhaps all of us. So our work or knowledge development on this area will guide us into the policy. So flattening of our fatality, recessions, and bankruptcy, all the three have to be worked together in order to find the viable solution. And that is where we require. So if we know this for any pandemic, then we need to develop the response. So from a governmental or from a broader system perspective, it requires the policies. So the response or actions of control or minimum, eliminate will need to run through the policies. And that's where we need to connect these two elements. And that's what I'm trying to focus in, in my talk now, that how can we learn from the engineering to guide the pandemic risk management, which means how can we learn from engineering to develop responses that lead to effective policies, which minimizes the overall risk. So the sec this core part of my talk is focusing lessons learned or the techniques available in safety and risk engineering applied to pandemic situation. So to simply illustrate this, I have taken 10 different steps and I'll go a one by one in a simple way and towards the end, I will show you a case study. So first, the foremost step in we do in engineering safety, but equally applicable in our pandemic risk management is to borrow the concept of hierarchical safety principles, which means we need, rather than picking and choosing according to convenience, we need to systematically follow the hierarchy which has a proven record. So which means first and foremost, we look for options of elimination. That can we eliminate the situation by sealing the border or by restricting. Then we develop the engineering control which is the, as you say, hospitalization. Then comes the administrative control, such as remote operations, remote working, minimizing the social distancing. And, and the last, the weakest resort is PPE, protection, uh, protective uh, personal equipment, which is, you know, the gloves and all. Unfortunately, if you look into the media or our policies, most of us are often rely here. It's not that governments are not working on them, they do but they remain hidden from the society. And society only sees this aspect. Whereas our argument is that our policies should guide us taking every possible step on the first two steps before we come to rely or use our less effective measures such as PPE. And there's a whole discussion why these are less effective. You might have seen in the media and others that that because it's the personal choices, it's always going to have a relatively lower effectiveness because individuals, their actions vary and their action influence others. That's why it becomes less effective. So if I'm not maintaining a social distancing or not wearing a protective equipment, 
I'm not only putting myself at risk, but I'm in fact affecting others. And that's where why it is dangerous. So understanding and implementing hierarchical safety principles is the key in the first step. The second is to look into early signs. As we see situations evolving, we monitor and take proactive action in terms of eliminating and engineering control. And here is a very good example, actually, from Taiwan, that we, they clearly have seen that next door to China, that they only seen the symptom and they closed the border and provided very control entry and quarantine for the people coming from Wuhan. And that way, they were able to help minimizing, they couldn't completely eliminate, but help minimizing the first hierarchy of the implementation followed with the second. And in the process industry, we do regularly. This is a very typical graph, which we often monitor in our process system. So this is a clear indication that we can learn and adopt. So detecting early and handling is the key element. And we have clear sign available all the time. The third important, which is perhaps is a key element in the decision making and action taking is considering the risk scenarios. And this often make us to make uh, error of judgment or error of, of calculation means, and this is uh, perhaps broader in the context of uh, of, of, of regulations or the intergovernmental aspect. Because if they fail to capture the broader risk scenarios, they may miss out and that might impact them in long term, perhaps in a more catastrophic form. And one of the examples to see is, is in India, when they lock down, they could, they didn't realize that that particular action, which is a, a, a strong action required in a given condition, will have a completely new risk creation. That is for migratory people, the people who will not have work and they will have hard to live. And as you might have seen in the media, that has perhaps created one of the largest mass exits in, 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 in the subcontinent. So it is very important in any policy or control uh, response development that all the risk scenarios need to be investigated. And then right side of the window are the few critical elements that need to be studied as the response is getting developed. Now, the fourth importance, once we are able to follow the hierarchy, we are able to proactively monitor and consider the risk scenarios, now we develop the response. So we have done the, all our background studies. Now it's time to take action. So what control should we take and how effective, what effective should be? So that is a key element. So as we have a suite of actions or control action available, as we saw in step one, we can now study their impact and see what works the best in a given condition and enforce or develop policy to enforce that. And you could see they could vary depending upon the situation where one in, and that is the key element. So a response needs to be developed based on the risk scenarios investigated in the previous step. Once you have the response developed, which is the control actions, now it is time to implement. But before we launch ourselves as a response, we do study how they would be effective, both in a, in a qualitative form and in a guided form. So here is an example which we undertook, that if we take no actions, this is how the situation would look like for the region. And this is different control actions if we take them. If we school, uh, shut down the school now, or we shut down the school after a certain number of days, if we do the public emergency declared now, or if we do later, how this impact will look like. So you could see the peak shifts and the peaks uh, uh, duration and the width also shifts significantly. 
So if we are able to develop effective control as a response, we are able to analyze and then implement and monitor. So if we have developed or imp and implemented the response, now we can monitor this and see how far our assessment of the response was what happening on the ground reality. And that will guide us into evaluating our actions in the next steps. So once we have implemented our control actions, it is time to monitor what has worked and what would need to be further improved. And that is the key element. And unfortunately, I, I feel hesitant to say that we fail often on this critical step. We believe we have taken the right step, so it should be happening right. But the fact that there are underlying reasons, which sometime beyond you and my understanding in the initial phases, that might not give us the results which we are expecting. So by closely monitoring the situations, we all will be able to collect the relevant data and guide our actions so that feed us back to the system. So as you see here, we could have the responses known for our actions and that will re-guide or guide us to know what is our risk in the next interval of time. And this way, the risk is a continuously evolving parameter rather than calculated in the beginning of the situation. So now risk will remain this way, a very living parameter on everyday basis. And that guide us the policymakers to be able to establish the confidence that they have taken right action and also inform community and society that they are moving into the right direction. And here is an example that when we take actions in a different timing, we can visualize their impact. I will revisit this in a, in a, in a minute in another context. The seventh step is to identify the vulnerability and susceptibility group. That is, unfortunately, in the current COVID situation, we failed and many countries failed. And this is unfortunate. That while we did or we uh, evolved to do the good steps in the phases I mentioned, we somehow either became less vigilant or less concerned and to our vulnerability group. So we calculated risk for a commoner and we thought that worked the same for a vulnerable group, such as people with uh, medical conditions or people with uh, age. And unfortunately, that, that has caused serious impact. So I can share Canadian experience that one of the issue in Canada, particularly in the main provinces of Canada, the old age home became one of the hottest spot and reason because of their vulnerability and, and their susceptibility because of the situation they were being operating. So while we have developed the scenarios, the, evolve them into response and implement control and monitor the actions of control, we need to treat our vulnerable group or susceptible group entirely different as a protective. So the way I have been describing this to myself and my colleagues is that this is like a jewel. So your house is already locked by the door and the locks, but would you not protect more carefully your valuable, such as your diamond rings or your uh, cell phone uh, or any other greater valuable thing? You will put them under more lock. Why? Because they're just so valuable. So you wouldn't take the same risk as what you're taking for your common household items to, the, to that particular. And that needs to be treated independently. And that's why I have highlighted this as an independent step that need to be studied and managed into independently. And that's as we have seen repeatedly, both in Italy and Canada, as I cite an example, has in fact guided us that if we don't do, we unfortunately going to see a very serious negative impact. Now, so we do all these steps, one to seven, uh, developing, uh, identifying, and then developing risk scenarios, and then developing uh, the response, implementing response, monitoring it. Why? 
the end objective for us is to bring recovery to make our society or our system as a whole to be resilient because we are now facing or we will face many such similar situation in in in, in future the question remain how quickly we could able to recover and that depends on our system to resilience that how robust is our system to accept a failure and able to recover from that failure so all the step 1 to 7 is actually done to develop a resilient community or society from an epidemic perspective which means that we see here we see the fall of the failure but then we start to recover into them so the in the modern age in our hazardous systems we now designing system that can accept the failure i give you a very simpler example so in in 70s or 80s we had a, a tire that had tube so when you drive one of the possible accident on highway as i mentioned early could simply be the flat tire and that causing a very high number of accidents on the highway then became the tubeless tires so that has a has removed significantly the possibility of a flat tire and thus improved the safety on the road but then still there is a possibility of a flat tire happening if if the tire uh, thickness goes low and the roads are conditions not or if there is a sharp object on the road now in today's system when we are building the resilient systems we have now evolved a chemicals or polymer that is now injected in the tire it freezes or it capped or it 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 uh, it, it, it it plug the leak as soon as there is a depression into the flat into the tire so as soon as there is a flat tire condition or a sharp object cut or pinch a hole into the tire that chemical react and actually solidify and and plug that leak so you could able to while accept the failure which means you accepted the punching and you quickly recover and you continue driving of course the tire is not the same strength as it was a new but it is still operating so you have minimized so my dear friends in engineering systems we have developed and we continue to develop more resilient system so that we can accept failure and recover and recovery is always going to be often a step below to the system so all the step 1 to 7 are designed to from our situation to bring a resilient system so according to eu studies which i'm citing here that we are foreseeing a recovery and this recovery rate will depend upon actions taken the response taken by the countries in the situation and as often you will see that recovery may not be quick and to the same normal it would lead to a new normal and eventually with passage of time make asymptotically reach to the same normal as it was before but it at least will have a system where it could operate so if we do what we are committing from step 1 to now 7 uh, we would develop a more resilient system that able to guide us through and to enable this resilient system we need to understand two key element which is that might last two steps is a holistic approach of managing risk risk is just not about the dollar value risk is not just a one fatality risk is a very integrated parameter that must capture all the variation into the societal economical geopolitical parameters which we identified earlier if we fail to do that that is almost like having a weak chain in your big chain a weak link will break the whole chain at any point of time so that is a must at this particular condition that we adopt a holistic approach and the last step is where we in the engineer comes up using advanced tool techniques and the knowledge to assess and manage risk so this point 10 or step 10 and step 9 feed into the all the 1 to 7 step which give us the product which is step 8 which is resilience 
So you see that we have to now, in today's modern time, rely heavily on our modeling capabilities, which as you know, or many of know, has, has evolved into a greater aspect. So club with our experience, knowledge, technology, we must be able to evolve and analyze evolving condition and predict risk, monitor and manage it. And that's where we have to focus. If we want to recover from the current situation, and prepare ourselves for an unwanted situation in time to come, we must adopt this 10 point or 10 step approach to be resilient so that we can accept failure and able to bounce back in quicker and in resilient way. So that's what my uh, under analysis of what we could learn or borrow from, from a, uh, engineering to help pandemic in a systematic way. The key focus of my later part of the talk is to take or borrow this model approach and see you how engineering modeling approach can help guide our epidemiologist. And that's the key, uh, which is just one aspect I'm trying to highlight. So if we go back and try study what is existing into the literature, is the range of model which epidemiologists, scientists often use. They could be compartmentalized, vector-based, spatial, individual, network, and meta-population. All these have served their purpose and they're fantastic methods or tools to analyze what is happening and how this what's happening is evolving with time. That guide us to our action and make us to look where we're going. One of the approach which is relatively easier and widely practiced among in the engineer and scientist is the third model, which is what I wish to focus in, in the next few minutes, which is talking about the three important parameters which we developed earlier, susceptibility, infection, and recovery. So we analyze these based on the population and then study these parameters. So this approach has evolved over a period of time, studying different type of phenomena or situation evolving. The one which uh, uh, my group has recently worked on is called, de developed is called SERQRD. And that is very unique to COVID situations because we have quite a uh, uh, people or those who do not show sign. And we have quite a different recovery factor as compared to uh, other pandemic situation. So one of our uh, scholar has devoted his time and uh, on this aspect. So I'll share what he has done on this. His name is Alauddin and he, 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 he did a good job. So, so we took uh, the common model and evolved into COVID situations. So we still have susceptibility exposure, as you could see as any group. Then we have the two uh, infection time, asymptotic and with the symptoms. And we monitor both. And then we have the impact of quarantine. One of the key elements which we have seen has overburden or our system is hospitalization and the ICU. So that is a very unique here, captured as a cue. And then we have recovery and disease, which is focus. So that's the conceptual mind model of the system. The interesting part of this model is the parameters which are used in the modeling of these, such as theta one, two, two three, which define the whole model are actually drawn from the population. So rather than making an assumption to, we take the sample and use the population sample to define these theta one, theta two, theta three, and calculate. And that's way these set of modeling equation continue to operate with function of time and also a continuous learning pro process. As I mentioned in my earlier, step number six, where we're talking about monitoring the actions and bringing that knowledge back into the model to analyze. And this is how it is being done into the system. So if we take that approach and analyze, very interesting we would observe that if we follow the simply the predictive models, which we have just described, without the learning, this is the prediction as you see, asymptotically going very high. Whereas if you do the learning, 
it forms a different curve. So the blue line here is showing how we are observing in real life the numbers evolving in fashion, where the yellow line here is a prediction. So as you may clearly see that our forecast based on the learning of from the field helping us guide into what is expected in the next time interval. And that way we remain better informed and this better information help guide the policy and relaxation action accordingly. And that's which we'll talk in the next step. So if we take that approach when through this particular model and then analyze the actions, the response, the control action. So this is the right side is what generally we do in safety engineering. We have designed safer process, then we put the controls on it. We pull alarm on it to highlight the unwanted situation. We do heavy instrumentation, then we do physical confinement, and then we develop the emergency plan and contingency plan. So this is a what we call as layer of protection. This we do for all of our hazardous operations, whether it's a hydrocarbon processing, storage, or nuclear processing or nuclear plant. So they all um, operate under this so-called a layer of protections. The all layer of protections are not solid as shown here. They all may have holes and that's what causes the accident. So we can learn or borrow this concept into the pandemic situation and we did and we implemented these action in the same way. So vaccinations is what we believe in the safer option provided we have that, which currently we don't. And because we don't, it will consider to be a part of a uh, later outcome. So this doesn't exist. So it's in the reverse order. These are the action and their effectiveness. So if we implement these control actions based on the hierarchy of safety, as we saw in our step number one, this is how we see the responses. So if we do nothing, that's how it look like the situation. And if we take actions, controls, and we take time-dependent control, this is how we would see the response evolving. And this response will keep changing as we collect more data and we live into the time. And as you see, the curve is start shifting towards it and eventually flattening. Now, the same way, if we do delay in our reopening or uh, taking steps, this might also reflect changes into our situation. So interesting part, which I wanted to show is the part here. So you see, this is the first peak, which is expected. And once we reopen after 70 days, as you see a new peak evolving. So now, depending upon where and how our hospital system or our community is prepared, we could able to evolve our actions accordingly. So this provide us a mechanism that we can able to simulate, analyze, and guide our actions. That is where we hope. So in conclusions, my basic aim was to provide you an approach that helped guiding engineering to the pandemic situation. We believe strongly that advanced tools, such as mathematical tools, and also some of the machine learning approaches available today, help guide us immensely into simulating the condition and guiding our control action. But the foremost step is that we need to be prepared to foresee the situation. And our policies should be guided by our science and not by simply perception. In today's time, we have significant advancement in both science and engineering that can define us the time the situation evolve and that should guide us our actions and policy. If we fail to acknowledge, accept and adopt, nothing but we will be doomed, as you might have seen in many regions that exactly what's happening. So I leave you with a simple thought. That was my key goal today, to learn to respond rather than to react. And response requires forcing the situation, thinking about it, and then developing the control action. With this note, 
I thank you very much for very passionate listening. Uh, back to you, Professor. So, folks, well, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions if you may have. Yeah. So. Thank you, Prof, uh, for the informative, simple, and easy to understand presentation. I believe the viewer would like to have your thoughts on several issues which may or may not uh, related to the topic today. Uh, thus, I, op I now open for the uh, question and answer session. All right. So, let me go through the question first. Okay, we have a, a question, Prof. Uh, it is from um, Associate Professor Dr. Sharifah Kamila Sajjiso from School of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering. So, her question is, on the global pandemic situation, the responses from the countries are sometimes diverse and do impact local action and can lead to ineffection, ineffectiveness. So, how can this be solved? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I absolutely agree. And that is what my talk today was trying to focus on, is that we need to guide our action based on the science. Mm -hmm. And these actions should be translated into policies. And as you might agree with me, that policies are the tool with the government that they implement and guide from top down. So it has to start from the center all the way to the village. So if center doesn't formulate a policy, then the local community or a body in the village would be very hard to implement because they will be violent. That is the reason why I'm very, very strongly opinionated in this matter that the responsibility come on this issue from top down. And the guidance should also come from the top down. I agree, according to the local situations, actions might be different. The policy implementation into executable actions may be different. For example, I'm just saying it very metaphorically, if People have to go point A to B. In certain region, it may be walk. In certain region, it could be bicycle. Or in certain region, it could be a bus. So this uh, tool where the policy need to be implemented might vary according to the local condition. But the policy and its execution has to be top down. I hope I made an attempt to answer your question. Sorry, thank you, Prof. Um, I, agree, I also agree with you. Uh, the top-down uh, management is the most important, uh, you know, before uh, the the uh, followers can uh, do their parts, but the policy is the most important thing to uh, focus on first, right? So we have another question okay, from um, uh, Mama Afifi Abdul Mukti. So the question is, uh, we cannot sanitize the world. Right? But individually can play a role. Individual can play a role. However, attitude varies. How can we respond to negative attitudes towards measures taken against pandemic? In Malaysia, individuals are arrested, fined, and or imprisoned. So, how this how is the action taken by the government of Canada? Good, very good. Very good. Uh, yes, my friend, I agree with you. And that's why I emphasized in my uh, discussion that the PPE, the individual action in the bottom, is the most effective uh, thing. So if we rely solely on this, unfortunately, we are giving more opportunities uh, of ineffectiveness. Yes, if we do the top-down approach and we develop policy, and is strictly implemented, such as lockdown or wearing certain type of protective group, which we understand might be harder, but they need to be for a better good of the community. Then it means it needs to be implemented in full. So what is happening in Malaysia, Canada is no different. 
we do have a violators who choose not to uh, implement and uh, countries taking very strict rule. So I give you an example, very interesting example in so-called free world and which is amazing to understand, listen. So Newfoundland, which is the province I live, or is an island. So they decided that they are not going to allow any particular non-Newfoundland people to come in. They wanted to completely seal the border. So they sealed the border. The only way to arrive is generally flight or by. Now, this is actually, if you see one way, is a clear violation of fundamental right of the individual according to Canadian Charter. So it was a very tough decision for the government to take, but they did. And here comes the issue. So a person who is living outside Newfoundland, but Newfoundlander, born and brought up there, wanting to return to Newfoundland. Unfortunately, government denied it. So it's not people like me or those. The government denied a person, who, and she, of course, the individual was coming for a reason. There was a funeral, but government didn't. So that case went to the Supreme Court and getting this debated about the hum, the rights of the people. But at this point, mm -hmm. government didn't care about. Mm -hmm. Government wanted enforcement. Yes, there will be some infringement. Yes, government might get a bit of uh, red faces here. But that need to be. For what? For greater good. For good for everybody. So mm -hmm. I think the actions would need to be taken and perhaps a strict way and then others will follow. So there is in Canada situation is very similar to what you've been saying. There have been fines to the people who are not seen observing the social distancing. There have been many people been fined on this mm -hmm. and uh, there has been at least I remember one case where they have been threatened for uh, for for the jail action. Mm -hmm. So I give you a clear example in Newfoundland which is happening and this is going in the court. So yes, if we want to be develop a, a system, then we need to be. Mm -hmm. There is the other side of the discussion which perhaps for some other day that is this make us to be a stronger community or resilient? That is a question. And yeah. I perhaps will keep it for some other day. Okay. Right. Uh, I think I think uh, that's all the question. Okay, Prof. So before we so thank you, Prof, for the explanation. So I think we have reached uh, but we almost have one hour session for today. So uh, I think we have reached the end of this 39. Uh, distinguished lecture series. So I hope the review, uh, the viewers have fruitful and informative mind-opening morning session, right, with our honourable speaker, Professor. So I liberally thank all viewers for spending your time with us in this live session. So please not to worry because this is uh, this session can be replayed anytime you like because it is recorded. So before we end the session, I pass over. Professor Dr. Nohazilan Mano to close this DLS session officially. So over to you, Prof. Hi, Assalamualaikum. Uh, Prof Faisal, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you okay. very much for giving this opportunity. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's been a while since our last meeting, uh, yeah. I think back in 2015. Okay. To, to our viewers, uh, for your information, Prof Faisal is our frequent visitors. Uh, and UTM and also Memorial uh, University of Newfoundland uh, have a, such a fruitful collaboration and I, I believe the collaboration is still ongoing. Indeed. And also uh, Dr. Libretti actually is the, he had undergone tra research training at Memorial University of Newfoundland, I think like six years ago and supervised by Prof. Faisal Han and Prof. Faisal has helped her to uh, reshape uh, her research direction. So thank you for that. So when it comes to your presentations, uh, thank you so much again for your great uh, contribution to our distinguished lecture series. And uh, I believe your presentation is uh, uh, was a very insightful uh, and it gives an additional spectrum of uh, knowledge to make us better understand how to respond to the pandemic COVID-19. 
from engineering perspective uh, and I'm very fascinated how you correlate risk assessment and management with COVID-19 pandemic. And also the keywords, reaction uh, versus responses. As, as we know, reactions are instinctual, uh, as termed from the subconscious mind. No filtering process, but responses are more thoughtful. And when you respond, you first explore in your mind the possible outcome of your reply before you saying a word. So, so it gives uh, additional uh, information on reaction versus responses from the uh, from the COVID nineteen perspective. And thank you so much again, Prof. Faisal, and to all our viewers for your information. I would like to say these things to Prof. Faisal. For your information, Prof. Faisal, now in Newfoundland, it is uh, I think eleven o'clock at night. Am I right, Prof. Faisal? Yeah, that's right. So he's so committed so determined to be with us mm -hmm. this is something that we can learn especially the young generation uh, his determination his commitment to our program so for that thank you so much and hopefully we can meet in the future after the end of the COVID 19. Mm -hmm. and to all our viewers don't forget to like our facebook to follow our youtube channel and if you miss some of the content of profile presentation don't worry we, the record uh, the session is recorded okay to profile thank, thank you, you so much uh, thank and you very much thank you to all our viewers bye 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 okay. well, thank you all bye. for joining us thank you thank you all right bye -bye. okay assalamualaikum